This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Poor Pocket 6K might be going on the market here soon. We're here to have a shoot off. Now I'm just gonna be honest with you, I may not have given Sony enough of a chance in the past and I'm sorry about that. You know, I have tried the FX3 and I have tried the A7S3. I've even tried the FX9 in the past and I kind of, just made videos about them just to test them out, see what they were like. But I never really actually considered them for one of my own cameras because I never really needed something like that. You know, I kind of avoided this whole hybrid game for a long time. But today we're talking about the camera that made me start to take Sony more serious and that's the Sony a7 IV. Now I'm looking for a camera to go alongside my Komodo. I'm definitely not getting rid of my Komodo. I would probably not gonna do that for a very long time because it's just too good of a camera for me on the commercials that I shoot. But I'm obviously not just a commercial cinematographer, I'm also a YouTube creator on the side, so a hybrid might make more sense for me. But you know how I do, I wanna see how good the image quality is coming out of this camera. You know, I don't normally focus on the usability of a camera much on this channel, I really like to focus on the image quality. And I'm sure you've seen other videos of the a7 IV already and they probably already talk about the features that it has internally in those wretched menu systems. So we're mostly just gonna talk about the image quality in this video. So the first thing that I did with this camera after I pulled it out of the box was to compare it to my Red Komodo, cause that just made sense. I also wanted to see how well I can match it to my Red Komodo, because if I is going to be my B camera in the future, that's gonna be super important, is how well those colors can match. Now normally in the past, I would just say that it's silly, like why even try to match a Sony to a Red? Just get two bodies that are the same and use those so you know they can match easily in post. Why? why I go through all this you know trouble of doing that but if I'm gonna have two cameras I want two bodies that are gonna do different things and have different use cases so the first thing that I noticed when I was comparing them is that there's a lot of latitude here in the Sony a7 IV and that really surprised me this 10-bit 422 codec is really holding up and surprisingly in a lot of these shots I kind of like the color more on the Sony because it has a little bit more of a blue cyan shift in the shadows where as my Komodo tends to lead a little bit red a little bit warm now I can obviously to com completely correct that in post. It's not a big major deal. But if I'm looking for just the image to straight out of camera, I do like that kind of cooler tones in the shadows. I usually actually add those cooler tones in the shadows anyways to my Komodo, um, just from a style standpoint. The next thing I obviously noticed was the resolution difference. You know, this camera, the a7 IV is shooting in 4K, whereas the Komodo is shooting in 6K. Now in this comparison, I was doing the low quality version on the Komodo and I was doing the 422 4K codec on the a7 IV. So we're dealing with a compressed image versus raw, so obviously there's going to be some differences. So obviously my first thought was to compare the Sony a7 IV to my RED Komodo. It's always a great baseline to compare it to like a true cinema camera with raw capabilities and stuff like that. But then I just thought we should go all the way with that and compare it to a bunch of cameras that are on the market right now. Because basically all my friends in town have one version or another of some camera that's out right now. So I called up my buddy Corey and my friend Al and we're gonna actually do a little shootout. Shoot out! Between the A7 IV, the Komodo, the FX3, the FX9, and the Alexa Mini, and maybe we'll even throw the Blackmagic Pocket in there as well because you guys know that I love that camera, and see how these perform next to each other. We're here to have a shoot off. Should we do, oh, sad, sad story. What happened? Oh no. So we're pumping a couple 600 Ds through the window so we can have control over the sunlight because right now the sunlight is like a weird color temperature outside and it's gonna move the whole day and that's not gonna work for us. Get a shot of me wrapping this cable. Ooh, sexy cable wrapping. <laughs> what everyone needs to learn on a film set. So once we had the scene all lit, it was a matter of testing out each camera in the same environment. Now we didn't wanna do a side by side necessarily because when you do that, it's kind of hard to get the same field of view every time and we were dealing with a lot of cameras. What we did just learn is that on the FX9, if you shoot in the 3840 and not full DCI 4K, it crops the sensor so it's not quite as wide 
as the 4K on the FX3. So we figured why not just light the scene and then set up each camera in the same way, in the same location, and then I would basically do the same move as the model when I'm walking through. And we just wanted to see how the cameras performed in that environment. So each camera was set to either its native ISO or 800 ISO. We actually, I think, pretty much kept everything at 800 ISO just to keep it all even. The raw cameras can obviously have their ISO changed in post if we need to, just to make them match. But we lit the scene for the 800 ISO cameras. And then we used my Mikey cinema lenses to put on the front of each camera. Some cameras were super 35 millimeter sensors and some were full frame. So we decided to use the 35 millimeter T21 lens for the full frame cameras. And then we used the 24 millimeter T21 for the super 35 cameras. Three, two, and you come up just like a skosh. But we set this up to expose for middle gray on all the cameras. And that put us around between a 2.8 and four split on our aperture. And that let some of those highlights in the background kind of stay brighter and the shadows in that lower right corner to get darker. And that way we could see the full dynamic range of all the cameras. Now we didn't nail this perfectly every time. You can see on the pocket footage, we uh, I think we just like forgot to pull focus on that one. Cause it just looked, it was already so deep. It was probably just hard to see shooting at that high of an f-stop on a super 35 millimeter camera. But then on a lot of the tests, we also would open the lens up at the end just to see how that shallow depth of field looked on each camera to compare. And if you like shallow depth of field, I'm sure that you really like that 35 millimeter on the full frame cameras. Now the 35 and 24 are probably not perfectly color matched, but for the sake of this test, I don't think it's a big deal. We're not really necessarily looking at just color here. We're looking at dynamic range, resolution, detail, and really the test is just to see if it really matters what camera you buy right now in the market. Cause you're always hearing people say that all cameras are good right now. And I think this test probably proves that to be true. It obviously made sense to compare all these to the Alexa Mini because it's kind of the gold standard of image quality. Now we didn't push these cameras up or down or anything like that. We lit it, we lit it properly because that's how I would do it with any camera if I was on set. I'm not normally pushing my cameras too hard. I light my scenes to make sure they look good. So you'll notice here that looking between all these images, there's not that big of a difference. Of course, the stock color that comes out of each camera is a little different, but if you use a color chart, you can and correct that however you want. But also you're probably gonna grade to your own taste anyways in post, so it's really not that big of a deal. You know, my opinion on the subject is the Sony's all looked very similar. The colors were a little different. The FX3 and the FX9, they have a little bit more of that pinkish hue in the skin tones. Um, the A7 IV is a little bit more muted, which I tend to like actually. And then I feel like the Komodo and the Alexa kind of looked the closest. And then obviously the red also looks like a raw camera. The raw cameras all looked like raw cameras. And what that is is kind of hard to describe. I think I think it has something to do with the detail that's coming out of a raw image and it's you know it's less compressed so there's less smoothing going on less noise reduction actually no noise reduction um although the airy camera is shooting in progress 444 it still looked like the raw cameras basically but something I did find looking at all these and comparing resolutions and whatnot is that the Pocket 6K seems to look more compressed than I would have thought. You know, I've used that camera a lot. I've never really noticed that before, but looking at these images, the detail in that one looked a lot different compared to some of the other cameras, but maybe that's a topic for another day. So this was a mixed color temp. It probably doesn't look like that really when you're looking at the images, but the sky outside was a really weird tungsten kind of temperature for some reason. We don't know why there was red dirt floating around or something. So we had to augment all the light ourselves and compete with that. There was also a lot of green coming in from the bounce off the trees outside coming into that kitchen. So we tried to, you know, kind of combat that with lights inside, but most of our lights were set at 5,600 Kelvin. But in order to make this kind of accurate as possible, we white balance off of a gray card inside and we use the Alexa mini as a reference point. So we white balance using the Alexa mini and we got a 4,200 Kelvin. Kelvin um, white balance. And so we set 4,200 Kelvin on all the cameras moving forward. We thought this was a good baseline comparing it to the Alexa since that is the king of cameras. Now, of course we can move the white balance around in post. Not all these cameras are raw, but that 10 bit file tends to hold up well if you try to move the white balance around in DaVinci, it's gonna kind of guess the colors and it worked out totally fine. And surprisingly enough, the 10 bit codecs in these Sony cameras really hold up. So let me know in the comments below what you thought of all the images compared. Which one was your favorite? Which one would you choose if you had to choose out of all of these cameras that we tested. What's fun about this is like, yeah, I was comparing to the a7 IV, but you could use this as a reference point for any of these cameras if you're looking to buy any of them right now. Is it a wrap? Dude, that's a wrap. That's a wrap. Camera shootout. 2022. Al, how do you feel? Uh, we're out of warrant. <laughs> <laughs> that's a problem. <laughs>
Squarespace is an all-in-one platform to present your work online. Now, as a cinematographer, filmmaker, photographer, you're definitely going to need to put yourself online, and Squarespace is a great place to do that. I've been using Squarespace for over a decade now to build my website and update it, and it's super easy just to do that on the fly. They even have an app that you can monitor your website remotely from your phone. Say you put an online store on there, you can actually see those orders come in. And then what I really like is the contact form. If someone wants to reach out to me for a business inquiry, they can fill out the contact form on my Squarespace page that I custom built through Squarespace. And I can basically set it up however I want. And then when that comes into your email, it actually says that you got a form submission from Squarespace. So you know that you're getting direct connection from your clients through your website. And you'll be able to monitor that really easily. It's just a kind of good way of separating out your clients from the normal stuff that you see in your email. So if you're anything like me and you need to present your work online, you can just do that with Squarespace. Click the link in the description to get 10% off. And I want to thank Squarespace for sponsoring this video. So there are obviously some limitations when shooting with a hybrid, but if you're considering the a7 IV, you already kind of know that going into it. You're clearly trying to get something that can shoot that 33 megapixel sensor for photos, or you know, you're all, and you're also trying to have video as a functionality as well. So I'm gonna build this out in a more cinema style rig. I'm gonna put a cage on it and a top handle and a monitor on it and see how I like it when it's kind of set up like that. And maybe see if I like the camera as a whole better once I kind of kit it out. So I've got this rig from Small Rig that I'm gonna build on it right now while we kind of talk about the camera a little bit more. So after doing quite a bit of testing with this camera now, I found that like it really matches pretty well with the Komodo. It's really surprising. And that's why I'm considering this camera as my next B camera. Um, I'm pretty sad. I don't really wanna sell my Pocket 6K or my Fuji, but I think it would just make sense for me to sell those so I don't have like five cameras. Like I don't need all these cameras. Um, and if this one's gonna basically do what those two cameras do combined, then why not? When looking at all the footage side by side with the other cameras, the thing I did notice for sure from a color standpoint is that the a7 IV has a little bit more muted and like less saturated colors than the other Sony cameras, um, which for me is actually a benefit because to me the a7 IV just looks a little bit more natural. I'm not going to really use the word filmic, but if you were to compare it like the Komodo or the Pocket or even the Alexa, the skin tones are not like that nuclear kind of pink that a lot of these kind of hybrid digital cameras get in them. The FX3 still has that problem. Obviously any of these cameras, you can change the color. They're 10 bit. They actually have quite a bit of color latitude there and they have a ton of dynamic range from a luminance standpoint. You can obviously get it there, but what I like is this one just out of camera, just with a, you know, a transform on it, turning the S-Log3 into Rec.709, the skin tones just look a little bit more natural on this one and they're not so pink. And which works really well with the Komodo because the Komodo has that same kind of style of skin tone. So matching this to Komodo has been really easy. So really how I would treat this camera, like I said, kind of selling my Fuji and selling my Pocket would be treating it as, you know, the hybrid between the two of those. The Pocket is amazing. Like I, I still think that camera is still the one of the best cinema cameras you can get for the cost. Pocket 6K obviously is what I'm talking about. You know, it's time for me to get something with autofocus for just for the sake of this YouTube channel. Um, I'm going to need some autofocus. So that's where this comes into play. I still think the Pocket probably just, you know, from a cinematic tone standpoint, the Pocket still kind of trumps this camera, but this is 95% there and has impeccable autofocus. And you know, in the past I would kind of frown upon autofocus from a camera, but more and more lately, it really has been intriguing me and the autofocus is so good. There's definitely some shoots that you can end up on and you might actually want some autofocus. If you shoot like interview B-roll type stuff, I have some friends that have the FX6 and they use that autofocus for their interviews. Um, so you don't have to sit there and manually do this if you're, you know, your person's moving in and out like I'm doing right now. You don't have to worry about that stuff and it really kind of changes the game on how we approach like that kind of corporate style work, which I don't do a lot of. I do mostly commercial stuff. So I don't really need autofocus for that, but it is something nice to have and obviously I need it for YouTube and that's why I'm considering it. And something else to talk about just while we're sitting here is this is oversampling from a 6K sensor, whereas like the FX3, the FX6 is like basically a true 4K sensor. Um, and so you're getting a lot more detail out of this camera in the 4K modes. And what's really nice about this camera is that you can go into the crop super 35 mode and you're still keeping all of that detail. You can shoot in 60 frames per second with no overheating problems or anything like that really. And you can treat this camera just like a super 35 millimeter camera if you wanted to without any issues. Whereas if you're using the FX3, you can't really crop in on that without losing detail because that sensor has way less native resolution on it. Now resolution isn't everything, of course. And you see that when we did our comparisons already. But if you want that extra detail and you want to be able to use this camera as both, this is the one to buy over the FX3. 
poor Pocket 6K might be going on the market here soon. And something also to consider if you're looking at hybrids right now is that this one has a, this, these Sony cameras all have full HDMI ports on there, which is basically essential. I hate micro HDMI. The fact that the new Canon R5C has micro HDMI, uh, HDMI on it is just bananas to me. Like you call that a cinema camera? I mean, let's not get into the whole naming thing here because we all know that the FX3 has a lot of limitations from a cinema standpoint too, and they call that a cinema camera too. You can't even change the shutter angle on it. You have to use shutter speed and that's just so silly. Now this camera does have a little bit of in-body stabilization. It turns out it's probably not as good as like the Panasonic, but I think for a lot of what I would be using it for, which would be kind of just like little handheld movements like this, it, uh, it might get the job done just fine. I mean, I'm, I'm more into trying to stabilize the camera on its own anyways and not worrying about in-body stabilization, but that's definitely a plus if you're looking at buying this camera. Pretty smooth. Please don't make fun of the mirror on top of this Fuji. That's how I view myself. But once I start using this camera as a vlog camera, then maybe I won't have to do that anymore because it has a uh, flip out screen. The thing that's really impressed me about the new Sony cameras just in general, but especially this camera, is the dynamic range that you're getting out of the new S-Log3 profiles. And why I'm saying new is because back in the day, S-Log was really hard to ex... That bird is really annoying. Really hard to expose because you always had to kind of overexpose it. You don't really have to do that anymore. I think there's some magic going on in these new Sony cameras because they're doing noise reduction in the shadows in a way that you can basically always save your highlights. Like, I know a lot of people have done dynamic range tests with these cameras and you're really getting a true 13 stops of dynamic range out of these cameras basically. And that's remarkable for a camera that's so inexpensive and so small and affordable. And it's really the reason that I've even considering owning a hybrid camera again, because you guys basically know that I've abandoned those a long time ago and I switched to the Pocket 6K and then now the Komodo. But the fact that it has 13 stops of dynamic range internally, just kind of remarkable for what it is. Now let's talk about RAW for a second because normally I really like raw cameras and there's a reason for that. And it's something I kind of want to make a video over in the future. And it's kind of hard some, It's kind of hard to articulate, but what's going on here, because there is so much noise reduction happening in this camera in order to get that kind of 13 stops of dynamic range, you lose a lot of detail. Because this camera is oversampling from 6K, you're getting more resolution packed into that 4K file, um, which makes it look much closer to my Komodo as far as detail goes. But in the end, you can't really compete with the Komodo because the Komodo is going to be 6K raw no matter what. And when you have that raw file, you don't have any noise reduction on there. And so you don't have anything going in there and messing with the file and smoothing things out so you keep all that detail. That being said, basically from what I can understand, if you're compressing the image, you're going to lose detail because you have to remove information from the file. And that's where the raw files are really kind of, you know, uh, superior to a compressed codec. We all know that that detail doesn't really matter that much in 99% of what you're doing. If you're shooting a movie and you want that detail, you're gonna throw it on a big screen, then maybe you should consider raw. But if you're not doing that sort of thing, then a compressed 10-bit codec with a high bit rate like this, this is 240 megabits per second. That's going to be just fine. It really comes down to preference. How much detail do you really want? Do you do you like it sharper? Like, preferably, I like detail. I actually like a sharper image. Actually, something that I haven't really talked about on the channel here lately is that I haven't used my ProMist or any softening filters for like the last six months. I haven't used them on any projects for a really long time, and I like that sharper detail, especially when I'm shooting like a YouTube video. Like, it's gonna go on a compressed format on YouTube. I might as well shoot it as sharp as possible. That way, it will. it's going to get muddied anyways when it goes to YouTube. YouTube, so that way it'll be sharper when you guys see it. I would still prefer more detail, but that's why I'm kind of compromising on this camera is by doing that 6K oversampled image versus like a Sony A7S III that's already kind of soft as is. 
Okay, so we've done quite a bit of tests with this camera. We did side-by-sides with it. I think it's probably time to do just like another kind of cinematic setup like I normally do on the channel. Let's like see what it would, if I just pick this camera up as it was now and shoot with it and I try to create something that I would normally create, how would that look? Because I think the reality is when you start comparing cameras, yeah, it's easy to see the discrepancies, see how they're different, but really how a camera feels and shoot is going to kind of dictate how you shoot with it, which in turn, if you don't aren't comparing it to another camera side by side every time you're shooting, you're going to have to just shoot the way the camera needs to be shot on. And that's something to always consider when picking a camera. Um, what camera is usable for you, it may not always be about the image. But once again, that's completely subjective. So I shot this scene just really quickly here in my house. I just wanted to kind of just see what the image looked like if I put it, you know, in a sequence, a kind of narrative sequence. I kind of went for like an Ozark look, something kind of weird and out of this world. That way I can just make it feel fun. But the regular images coming out of the camera looked really great too. I was just trying to have fun with the tone. So this is an all natural light. I did light some of these shots. So once I got outside, there wasn't much reason to light it because the kind of tone I was going for was looking into that bright sun. So that's just hard over the head light, just kind of blasting me right in the face. And then this was kind of fun because normally when I'm doing these little short sequences like this for testing, I have to set up a camera, put a follow focus on it, kind of get some marks and try to, you know, make sure I'm in focus. But this time I didn't have to do that. And I used the autofocus with the Sigma 18 to 35 for all these shots. I was able to shoot the sequence so much faster than I normally do because that autofocus is just perfect basically. And it just held on to me for 90% of what I was trying to do. You know, I don't know if the a7 IV is for you, but it is something that I'm definitely considering to be my next camera in my kit. But I think this camera can kind Kind of do it all. If you want it for content creation, you can do that. If you want it to shoot a commercial, I really want to hesitate to do it. I mean, there's a lot of dynamic range coming out of this camera. The Kodak is really nice. It can shoot 60 frames per second cropped, which is fine, but that shoots it up to 600 megabits per second if you don't use the S and Q mode. So you're getting a really high quality image when you're shooting the 60 FPS on this camera. Now, if you do want to shoot 120, I'm pretty sure you have to crop to 1080. Um, so be aware of that. If you really need 120 frames per second, you might want to consider the FX3 over this camera. So stay subscribed if you want to see if I purchase this camera camera, but I might be comparing it to some more cameras in the future. You're probably like, wait, what? I think I want to compare it to the Panasonic S5. A lot of you requested another video from me on the Panasonic S5 after I reviewed the Sigma FP again, because I think the price point of that is even lower than this a7 IV, and I bet the image quality is very close. So I should have an S5 here in the next couple days that I can compare to the a7 IV. Really, it comes down to if you need autofocus or not. I think the image quality out of both cameras is going to be really good. For me, I just kind of need autofocus now because I'm making so much YouTube content. Um, but if you don't need autofocus, I bet the S5 is a really big contender to the A7 IV. All right, well, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. This was kind of a long one, kind of a different one. I hope the camera comparison was useful for you guys. If you have any questions, just leave them in the comments below. And until next time, I'm Sensor Sakurai. See ya.